Lord say to us today through His Word as communicated this morning? I pray that the words of my heart and the meditations of my mind would be acceptable in the Lord's sight. In cinema, the director or the producer often decides to begin at the end. Well, I'd like you to imagine this morning King David again. King David stricken, stricken with grief. These are his words, his cry, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now, Absalom was King David's son. And like his dad, Absalom matured to be a gifted warrior and a leader, and many of us know by experience that parenting can be a joyful enterprise, but many of you also know that it can also be painful. The beginning. Absalom conspired against his own father, King David. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, beginning at the first verse, it says, In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses, and with 50 men to run ahead of him. It was a calculated betrayal. He intended on taking over the family business, which in this case was to be king over Israel as it was that day. Now just knowing that Absalom had turned on his father, how do you feel about him as a person? Now, Absalom was a strategic. He was a strategic manipulator. His tactic was to intercept people while they were on their way to see King David that he might judicially settle some of their conflicts and concerns. But Absalom would deceptively inform people that no one was available. The king was not available. However, if he, Absalom, was on the throne, things would be different. It says in verse 2 of chapter 15, Absalom would call out to him, to the people passing by, What town are you, are you from? And they would answer, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. And then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid, they're proper, but there's no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were appointed judge in the land, everyone who has a complaint or a case would come to me, and I would see that they receive justice. It's an ancient political trick, played out in our own political system today, amongst opposition parties. They foster discontent, don't they? With would-be's and insinuations and if only we were in power. But Absalom's ploy was all done in secret, out of the public eye for the most part, preparing people's heart to want change. And it says in verse 6, and so he stole the hearts of the men in Israel. And if we observe the last sentence uh, in verse 12, uh, and so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. Do you like this young man? A little manipulator, disrespecter of his own father. Well, the conspiracy fermented. Finally, it burst open. And by the time King David was informed, it was too late. King David had to flee the palace, and he fled with those who remained loyal to him. And to leave Jerusalem, you go down a slope, you go into a valley, and then you go up again, the Mount of Olives. And it says in verse 30, But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, his head covered as he was barefoot. And all the people with him covered their heads too, and were weeping as they went up. You see, King David in his lifetime faced a lot of adversity. But there's nothing that will break your heart and crush your spirit like your own child turning against you. Now our hearts go out to David, don't they? We, we wonder, how could a son do such a thing? How could a son betray his own father? Hmm. 
Battle lines are drawn. King David instructs his soldiers, even though we're going to battle against these, make sure no harm comes to my son Absalom. The love of a parent for their child can cover a multitude of wrongs. King David marched into battle. He commanded his generals, Joab and Abishai and Nittai. He said, be gentle with the young men Absalom for my sake. And the battle spread out all over the countryside, clashing swords, thuds of armor on armor, and the battles went deep into forested areas. And in the forest, Absalom's head was caught in an old oak tree as his mule ran off. He was alive, but in spite of David's orders, Joab, his top commander, thrust into Absalom into his heart, three javelins. King David, of course, that day was victorious against the ones that had betrayed him. But he only wanted the answer to one question. Is Absalom safe? The messenger had to relay the truth to David. Your son has died. And David was so shaken as he went towards the city, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The king covered his face and cried aloud. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. Well, that's the end of the story. But if we begin the story in 2 Samuel 15 and follow it to its end, what we have is a great distaste for a son who would betray his father. But more than that, our compassion sides with King David, whose heart is betrayed, beaten, and broken. But there's more to the story. While nothing can condone the behavior of Absalom, we might ask ourselves, how could the roots of bitterness grow so deep in Absalom's heart? You know, when learning to drive a motor vehicle, uh, we are taught that in every vehicle there are blind spots, right? There might be vehicles to the right or to the left of you and back a little bit, and even with your mirrors, you cannot see that they're there. And if we ignore that reality and we drive as if there are no blind spots, if we move forward as if there the possibility of no vehicles being there, then eventually we are going to cause an accident, aren't we? We are going to move to the right or the left and we're going to take out another vehicle. But all of us outside of the vehicle also see life and as we see life, we also have blind spots, every one of us. There are things that we cannot see, things about ourselves, things about other people, things about circumstances that we are involved in. We, we don't have the full perspective, and so we are living life, life as if some things aren't there. Now I know we consider King David to be a biblical hero of faith, but this man was human and he also had blind spots. And those blind spots negatively affected his family. We thought the conspiracy of Absalom against his father was the beginning. But it's not that way. Going back to 2 Samuel chapter 13, we learn of a crisis that occurred in King David's family. And it's not just your everyday average crisis. Amnon, which was another one of David's sons, asked his sister Tamar if she could take care of him while he was ill. And when they were alone, he raped his sister. He betrayed her trust. Well, the incident devastated Tamar. She puts ashes on her head. She tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away weeping aloud. And we learn that Tamar lives the rest of her life as a desolate woman. That sordid event 
wounded her emotionally as well as physically. She was never the same. Now that's a family crisis, isn't it? Whoa. And it needs to be dealt with. So where's dad? Where's the king? Dad. He's not present. Even upon learning about the event, the Bible says that he was furious, but he does nothing. He doesn't console his daughter Tamar. She's left alone. He doesn't confront Anna and deal with him in discipline or get him any professional help. Nothing. He, he leaves the whole incident as if it's in a blind spot. And he goes forward in his own life as if it never happened. Enter Absalom. He's the one who steps in as the bigger brother to care for his younger sister. Doesn't seem so, such a bad guy now, does he? And what impact did King David turning a blind eye have on him? Absalom began to hate his brother Amnon. And in light of his father's reaction, which was, I know nothing, I see nothing, Absalom takes matters into his own hands and he arranges for the murder of his brother. You thought you had a dysfunctional family. Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him, and don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered, and then all the other king's sons got up and mounted their mules and fled. Now what was David going to do? Keeping an incestuous rape in the blind spot was one thing. But now we have sibling murder. The king's sons came and wailing loudly to their dad. And the king too and all his servants wept very bitterly at the loss of Amnon. And I'll tell you what David did. He wept and he mourned. He mourned for three years, the Bible said. And Absalom fled for fear of his own life. And David pretended that he didn't exist. Out of sight, out of mind. After three years, 1,095 days, verse 39 tells us that David began to long to see his son Absalom again. But he made no effort to actually do it. And I wonder how Absalom felt during those three years. Tamar hadn't been consoled by her by her father after being raped. Amnon hadn't been confronted after raping her. And now it seemed that dad could care less about him, about Absalom in the wake of killing Amnon. And there were no efforts to reconciliation. And he had no idea that I, even after three years his dad began to long to see him. This is King David. Well, the Bible tells the truth, doesn't it? Doesn't leave the messiness and brush it under the carpet. A lady comes to see King David one day, because he's still the king, and she needs some wisdom, she needs some direction, she needs his intervention. She says to him, King, I, I'm a widow, and I only have two sons. And uh, my one son killed my other son. And now everybody hates the living son and wants to kill him, but if they kill him, then I'm going to be alone. And David has compassion on her, and he says, look at this, this is rough. He says, I'm going, to, I'm going to give an order to make sure that at least your living son is protected. And she's grateful for that. But then she says to King David, why, why is it when the king says this to me, he doesn't convict himself? Why doesn't he tell his commander to go and bring back his banished son? Can you imagine the guts of this lady? Mm -hmm. And David is convicted like he goes, how can I be so blind? And so he does. He tells his commander to go and get Absalom. But then something kicks into David's stubborn heart. And even though Absalom comes back into the city, he still doesn't want to see Absalom. He says he can stay in the city, but for another two years they have no face-to-face -face contact. This is a man who has a habit of putting things out of sight, out of mind. And what did this, how did this impact Absalom? Finally, Absalom insisted that he see his father, and they did meet after two years, but it was too late. 
The hurt in Absalom's heart had grown so deep that he had begun to conspire against his father. And that whole thing ends in David weeping. Well, Absalom, my, Absalom, my son, if I had only died instead of you. <clears throat> Here's the lesson, folks. And it's practical. And unfortunately, few families follow it. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a son, whether you're a daughter, an employer, an employee, whenever there's a conflict, whenever there's a crisis, if you deal with it by ignoring it, you have set the stage for worse things to follow. Ignoring reality by leaving it in your blind spot will lead to a crash. Those who have been hurt, like the Tamars, they need to be consoled. Those who have been who have committed the wrong, like Amnon, need to be confronted. And those who have been alienated and also committed wrong, like Absalom, need to be reconciled. Not after three years, not after five years, but as soon as possible. Leaving weeds never solves the problem. Their roots just keep getting deeper and deeper. And this was a habit of David, not only in terms of his, 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 his family... Uh, life, but even in his spiritual life. He committed a sin with Bathsheba, and rather than upon recognizing what he had done, confessing it to the Lord, he let it stay in secret. He got physically sick until Nathan the prophet confronted him and brought it out in the open. And only then did David repent. Selective blindness alienates families and alienates us from God. Selective blindness always makes the end of the story sad, one filled with grief and regret. As hard as it is, we need to be persons of integrity. When there's something that is that's a wrong has been done, we need to find the grace and the courage to deal with it up front. Sweeping it under the carpet never, never happens. So may God help us to not turn a blind eye to destructive behaviors. May God help us to be people of forgiveness, people of reconciliation. And you're thinking now in your own family about people who are alienated from each other. What will you do? Look what happened in David's life. The end of the story was not good. And it could have been very different. Heavenly Father, your word is brazen sometimes in showing us darker realities of our life and things that people can do to one another. And we are to follow these great examples of faith in terms of having a heart after God. But when we look at David, he was a man that was fractured. He was a man that was human and full of flaws. You loved him. But his mistakes had profound impact upon his family. God, help us to learn from his mistakes as much as we learn from his successes. And may we be people that put away wrath and bitterness and those emotions and forgive one another even as Christ has forgiven us. Help us to be a reconciling people for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of our families and our own emotional and mental health. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.